<clears throat> okay, yes. Good morning, everybody. I can see that a lot of people um, are joining the webinar as we speak. So I'm just going to hold off a couple more minutes and um, just make sure everyone's come through. So I've just unlocked it. It's all working. Yeah. <laughs> just got my support person here. So really great that you can come along this morning. Uh, we've got a really good session for you. It, the topic is uh, improving the health and well-being of Queenslanders. There's a little bit of um, variety today. We've got a couple of presentations actually focused on social prescribing, and we've also got a presentation from Health and Wellbeing Queensland around some of the work they're undertaking uh, uh, in, in the health and wellbeing space, particularly around obesity. And I think there's a new strategy that Matthew um, from Health and Wellbeing Queensland will talk about. Okay, it seems like the majority of people have just come through, so we'll officially start. Hi everyone, I'm David Millichap. I'm a business lead here at CheckUp, and I'll be the chair today for the Queensland Primary Healthcare Network meeting. Um, to begin proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today. For me here in Brisbane, that's the Yuggera and the Turrbal peoples. And also acknowledge we have people from right around the state online today. So acknowledging the traditional owners of the area where you're located and also pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging leaders. Uh, for those of you who are coming along to QPHCN for the first time, these are quarterly meetings. They've been going for, I think this is our 11th year of having these quarterly meetings. I, I guess they started off as meetings and now they're more, um, it was actually just a small group of people sitting around a table discussing issues in primary care. Now they've, it's evolved into um, four meetings a year, different topics, and we have um, guest speakers to share their knowledge and expertise and an opportunity to ask questions. Obviously, we'd love to hold them face-to-face, -face and, and that's how we have been doing it, and we'll look at probably a hybrid model in 2022 um, for these meetings. We'll have people in our, can come along to our office here in South Brisbane, and uh, we'll also keep going with the virtual because it means that people from right around the, the state can participate. Uh, well, just before we kick off with our first speaker, I'd like to acknowledge Hester. Um, Hester is the sponsor of today's meeting and all of our upcoming meetings, um, those quarterly meetings we'll be having next year. So we have Nanita Smith on the line and um, she'll be actually talking to you later this morning. So thanks so much, Nanita, for your support so we can put these meetings on. Okay, let's kick off with our first speaker and... That is uh, Matthew Dick from Health and Wellbeing Queensland. Matthew is the principal lead um, in public health nutrition uh, at uh, Health and Wellbeing Queensland. So Matthew, if you'd like to share your screen, I'll hand over to you. I, I will. Thank you very much, David. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and, and good morning to everybody in the, in the speak up, or the, sorry, the, um, the check up network. Uh, the last time I was with you was more than two years ago and speaking about our Queenslanders meeting the uh, the Australian Dietary Guidelines. So I was in person with you there, David, in South Brisbane. So that was good. And I believe that for, for this particular network, the last time you may have heard from Health and Wellbeing Queensland was probably about a year ago when Mark Tui came and gave an update on the work of Health and Wellbeing Queensland so it's, you know, it's my pleasure today to give you a, an update on where we're at now, at least 12 months after that. And Health and Wellbeing Queensland as a new agency is now just over two years old. And so our investments and our priority areas are shaping up pretty well. And so it'd be great to share with you today where we're at with that. So I'm gonna see how I go with sharing this screen. Okay, now, can you give that's me a right. thumbs up, David, if you can see that all right? Yeah, that's perfect, Matthew. That's good, okay. All right, thank you. So I would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands from across Queensland, where we're all meeting today. And we pay our respects to the elders past and present for they are the holders of the memories, traditions, the culture and aspirations of 
Torres Strait Islander people across Queensland. So Health and Wellbeing Queensland as an agency, uh, as, you, as you may well be aware, our remit is about, about preventing obesity and chronic disease prevention. So one of the other aspects for Health and Wellbeing Queensland that's in the Act is also about reducing health inequalities that is independent of our obesity work. So that's, that's the remit of what we do. I will talk about today our work around nutrition and physical activity in particular. Uh, and, and touch less on our work on reducing health inequities and around well-being. So the three areas that I did want to cover off on are the, the work in the First Nations area, our work in health promotion, which is predominantly where we focus on nutrition and physical activity policy and programs, and health system partnerships. And then what I want to finish off with is something that David alluded to, which is our plans for the future around the Queensland Obesity Action Plan. So firstly, with the, the work of First Nations, and this is, this is not a new work, and, and many from the team in Health and Wellbeing Queensland have been involved in working in the first, in, in remote food security anyway, for some time. So we've gathered that together under a, under a title that we, call, that we call Gather and Grow. And there's a number of activities that we're undertaking in that area that I just wanted to update you on. So one of them was a submission that we led to the federal inquiry into food pricing and food security in remote indigenous communities. And so we, we led that with, with partners from around Queensland and remote communities. And now we're following up on the recommendations that have come out of that inquiry. Uh, but more recently, we've held three roundtable discussions with leaders from remote indigenous communities around economic development. Uh, the second roundtable was around supply chain and freight. And the third one was on healthy housing. So we were fortunate enough to have around 130 stakeholders from government, non-government and community controlled and First Nations mayors who were able to attend those round tables. So at the moment we're finalising the reports from that, that that will contribute to finalising actions for remote food security. The other big strategy that we've undertaken in remote communities is to engage with community controlled organisations and across Cape York in the Torres Strait and also in far northwest Queensland. And with the, with the major Queensland uh, remote store group as well. So that's Community Enterprise Queensland. So all of these are about supporting local action uh, and, and running that through the stores and working with community and the, and the different groups that are there in order to support the, the local actions that they identify to address food security in those communities. This is, this is a, in terms of the phase that we're at at the moment, that it's, it's relatively new. And so the, the agreements that we have with the different community controlled organizations are, are fairly new. And so that's a, that's a very exciting piece of work that will build for us over the next few years. The second area that I wanted to update on is the work in health promotion. And that is primarily around our nutrition and physical activity policies and programs. So in the nutrition space, we have a number of policies and programs. And the, one of the first ones there is, is Pick of the Crop. And that is a, a school-based healthy eating program that is focusing on promoting vegetables and fruit in schools and creating a positive food culture. So as a part of that, we are connecting schools up with local farmers across Bowen and Bundaberg in particular. And we've also, we are, are also working with schools in the Logan area as well. So school gardening is a, a very common part of that program and schools are connecting that with the curriculum. So integrating in their, their maths and science and as well as health and geography, et cetera. So that's in its pilot phase at the moment and we have just evaluated and will be finalizing that evaluation report over the, the next month. Another, Another policy sort of slash program we've got going there is Healthy Kids Menu, and that is about supporting the, the non-fast food venues in Queensland to provide healthier options for, for families and children when they're eating out. So we've, we've got some, some resources there for businesses, and we're asking them to, to connect with us and engage. And there's some simple ideas in there around what they can do so that chicken nuggets and chips are, and soft drink and ice cream is not necessarily the default option that children get offered when they go out to eat. And so we're seeing some great 
great moves there among a small number of venues at this stage. We, we launched in July this year. So we're looking forward to building that and expanding that into 2022. The other one you may be aware of is a, a food and drink supply strategy that covers healthcare facilities called A Better Choice. And that has only recently transitioned across to Health and Wellbeing Queensland. And so from the beginning of next year, we will be leading that and we'll be looking to see how we can integrate that across our other food and drink supply strategies, which leads me on to the talking about sport and food in sport. And Queensland does have guidelines here for sporting clubs and associations around providing healthier options for food and drinks. And so that's getting a bit dated now. And our intention is to update that in the new year. We've, we've started work on that at the moment. And we'll be seeking to just look at how we can influence the, the sports sector to, to take up those guidelines more, more strongly than, than has been in the past. In the physical activity area, Health and Wellbeing Queensland has an MOU with Sport and Recreation. And so we're collaborating with them around a range of different activities. But one of the ones you might be aware of is the, the Active Kit Grant Program. And that is all about encouraging that, that's that active sector, active sports sector, active industry sector there to, to drive participation across Queensland. So Health and Wellbeing Queensland was able to top up the funds for that grant program to, to make more of that activity available for, for right across Queensland. The other area within the physical activity space is our engagement with local governments. And so at the moment, we're working with two local governments. So the first one is Toowoomba, and we're just supporting them around including healthy planning within their planning scheme and urban design framework. And for many of you who have worked in this space, you'll know that that's not necessarily new and the, the Heart Foundation have had guidelines around this for, for some time now. So this is just a part of us continuing that engagement to work more closely with councils. The second one is Ipswich City Council. And that one is about supporting young people and advocating for and trialing new approaches to create healthy spaces. And the focus out there in Ipswich is on younger people. So in the age group of 18 to 30, and a lot of it's about, well, particularly the concern coming from that community was around the high rates of diabetes. So we're, we're working with that council there around, around healthy places. And the final thing in the physical activity area is a, a, a digital platform for, for connecting communities across who are working in the prevention space. So we put a survey out just to try and engage with the prevention workforce more broadly across a whole range of sectors in Queensland. And hopefully a number of you in the webinar today, we're able to see that survey and, and provide that feedback. So we do wanna grow the physical activity area with in terms of the way we're engaging at Health and Wellbeing Queensland. And that will be based on the Active Australia roadmap. So there's more, there's certainly more work to go there. Now, the third area in terms of our, yeah, our structure and our, our team set up around our activities in the health system partnership area. And so what that team does is it, it, it's about leading integration with, with clinical prevention so that we can build that into the health system and prevention becomes a part of routine care. So it's about building the capacity of clinicians to address overweight and obesity. So there's resources and training that's a part of that particular strategy. And also about increasing the awareness of and the utilization of the prevention programs that are available statewide. So we would like to see the, the clinical care sector engaging more with those programs as a referral source for, for their clients. So combined with that are the prevention programs and we have a small team that does lead the commissioning and the, the management of that investment. And hopefully many of you saw recently our media release that we have funded uh, up to $68 million over the next few years for a number of partners. So. They include Deadly Choices, Jamie's Ministry of Food, 10,000 Steps, the Queensland Country Women's Association, Country Kitchens, My Health for Life, and about healthier school tuck shops and, and building the level of support that they have there. So that was, a, that was a very significant announcement from Health and Wellbeing Queensland, a great investment in prevention programs that'll be there for the next few years. 
The final thing I wanted to finish on is just what our intentions and plans are around a, a Queensland obesity prevention strategy. And so this is new, this is new news. And as many of you are aware uh, of the development of the National Obesity Prevention Strategy, and that that was out for consultation recently, that closed on the 3rd of November. So we know that the release of, of a national strategy around obesity prevention is still some months away, and that will be obviously early in, in the new year. So from our point of view in Queensland, it's imperative that we move that we move forward with an action plan that's relevant for us in Queensland, because we know that, that obesity is an ongoing urgent issue that needs to be dealt with. And so we want to build on what is happening at the national level and make it relevant for, for Queensland. The other, the other factor there is around the announcement of the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics. And so having a Queensland specific plan around obesity prevention is also a way to help us create some legacy initiatives that can be around up into the Olympics and beyond. So how are we going to do this? And we are in the early stages of planning that, but the, the plan is to, for us to a health and being Queensland to lead a collaborative and co-design plan that's going to guide our actions into the future. So we will build it off the, the three ambitions that are in the current draft of the National Obesity Action Plan and contextualise them for Queensland. So it is new and we have a, a goal to develop this and release it by the middle of next year. So at the moment, we're just currently just talking to people like the network here and just informing you that that is the, the plan and intention of Health and Wellbeing Queensland. There is a, a lot of support for, from our executive in order to do this. So at the moment, we're doing a scoping exercise. We're mapping current actions around the state against these three ambitions. And then we will be engaging more with other partners and stakeholders early in the new year around developing a, a co-designed action plan that will, that will take us into the future. And, and as I said, that that's the work over the next six months. So that's my, my quick update. And David, I'll finish there and happy to answer questions now, or if you would like to save them to the end. Thank you. Thanks everybody for listening. Thanks, Matthew. Um, I don't know if you can see the chat panel, but I've actually just typed out a long question. Um, can you see that? No, all I could see was the screen that I was presenting. Oh, okay. So if you could stop sharing now, stop sharing your screen, just hitting that button again. Uh, oh, I can do it for you. It's all good. Yeah, thank you. That's all, all good. Okay. Um, can you see the chat now? I've asked, I'll read it out for you. Um, we undertake an annual health survey called Health in Focus. Uh, it was open for a couple of months and just closed a couple of weeks ago. And we're analysing our data as we speak. And one of the questions we asked this year is about people's diet, exercise and alcohol consumption as a result of and during the COVID pandemic. And a majority or more people than not indicated um, their diet was worse, they exercised less, and they drank more alcohol. Um, I, uh, you guys um, undertaking any research into this or, or looking at what, how you could adapt your strategies as a result of COVID? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So one of our partners, Diabetes Queensland and the, do the My Health for Life program, they, they recently ran a, a, a similar exercise with some, with some survey questions out to the community. and. And I don't; those results are available, and I, I'm not sure quite sure why, uh, quite sure how how widely they have been distributed, but they're certainly available. And I would say the results coming out of that were similar to to these results here as well. So, yeah, absolutely. Our our intention, and the, and we're doing it at the moment, is to go through a, a market research approach to to continue to survey the Queensland community around exactly these types of questions. So that that's we've we've had that that research was probably two or well, like a th about two or three months ago now. And so the plan would be into next year to have, have a more ongoing you know, surveys happening from that point. Yep. Yeah, no, it's, uh, and, and there's a strong link um, between people's mental health and obviously their physical health. So we ask questions around that as well. And there's a strong correlation there between their self-reported mental yeah. health status. You, were you aware of the research that Diabetes Queensland No, had we weren't, but 
we know Diabetes Queensland quite well. They're a member of Checkup, so I'll certainly um, make contact with our yeah with our contacts there just to um, share results and, and and maybe talk about some um, strategies together. Yeah, okay. thanks right. for letting me know about that. Um, we actually have a I've got a hand up, um, Bradley. Um, to, to, to. Bradley, can you um, type your question in the chat? Uh, because this is a webinar. Oh, hang on, allow to talk. I've found a button for you, Bradley. So if you could turn your mic on, um, we'll have your question, thanks. Can you hear me now, David? Yes. Hi, Matt, um, it's Brad here from Children's Health Queensland. It's actually a similar question to David around being able to identify some of those behaviours, so food, vegetable, physical activity behaviours. Previously, you guys used to do kind of a telephone survey, I believe, that you know you include in the CHO report. Some of the kind of issues with that was the granularity in that data and actually being able to identify smaller population groups. Do you know what the future holds for you guys with, with that type of needs analysis and being able to understand those types of behaviours, the healthy behaviours? Yeah, hi Bradley. So yeah, uh, the the survey you're referring to will be done by the Department of Health as a, a part of their statewide um, their statewide sort of survey monitoring program. So I, I'm not exactly sure where they're at with that, but I would imagine that those statewide surveys will continue, and they are, as you as you rightly said, a a telephone survey. So yeah, it's it's limited in terms of how how deep you can dive into that data. And if you've, you've seen the, the way that the data gets presented you know, you know, in the CHO report and there's an online tool you can use as well, but you can, you can cut it by local government, you can cut it by HHS and by, by age and gender. So that, that's, that, that's kind of limited. So the, the other market research can give a whole lot more granularity to, to that data to help explain some of the things that are going on underneath and why, why some of those, those barriers are in place and what they are. And that, that could be more informative to help guide us around interventions. So that's the, I guess that's the additional level of, of, of granularity that Health and World Queensland will add to that data. So it, it, it has obviously pros and cons, uh, and won't be as generalizable across the state, but it does give us good insight into where people are at at the moment. Thanks, Matt. I hope that helps. It, it does, it does, yeah. Thanks, Bradley, and, and thanks, uh, Matthew. Okay, I can't see any more. Um, hang on, I'll just um, have one more look. Okay, I can't see any more questions there, uh, Matthew. So thanks again. Um, well, this meeting at the end of the year is traditionally, um, we have four meetings, as I said, and it's typically on health and well-being and, and those sort of issues. So um, because it is popular and we always get a good, um, good attendance at these meetings. So right. hopefully it won't be a year before we see you again. But um, yeah. thanks again for, for coming along today. If you need to head off, um, that's totally fine. We do have uh, two more presentations, but um, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can stay. Is your presentation fine. able to be shared? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Okay. We'll make sure we share that with participants as well. Okay. Thanks again, Matthew. And next, we have um, three. Oh, well, it's either two or three people presenting together. Uh, it's three. Okay. So next, we have uh, a, I was going to say co presentation, but yeah, it's um, as um, we heard, it's three organizations. I'm just looking at my notes. And we have Mario. Um, Gupta from Lata Consulting. We have Kimberly from Darling Downs Westmoreland PHN. And we have Fran from Checkup. And I'm not sure who's sharing this screen, but those three organisations are working on a social prescribing project based out of Toowoomba uh, area. I don't know a lot about it, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it today. Um, so I believe Kimberly might be sharing her screen there. So what I'll do is I'll hand over to the three of you. And um, once again, reminding people that if you do have questions, type them in the um, chat panel there. Okay, thanks. Not sure who's kicking off, but I'll hand over to the three of you.
Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, hey, Fran and Kimberly. Uh, Kimberly's currently Hi. sitting in um, Stanthorpe, uh, so she's dialed in to help us out with this project. Um, I'm hoping that everyone can see my screen, um, and which is yes. just the presentation screen, right? Um, don't want you to see my note screen because that's a that's convoluted to say at best. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for giving us the opportunity to come and share with you um, about our project that we're working on, which is known as uh, Social Prescribing and Lifestyle Modification Programs. Uh, Kimberly, you've raised your hand. Yeah, sorry, for some reason, um, it's saying that the host won't let me use my camera, so I can't have my face. Okay, um, Kimberly, I'll fix that. Give me thank one you. second. No problem. Thank, thank you. you. Um, what I'll do is I'll move into our next screen, which will give you a snapshot of uh, who Kimberly is uh, when her screen comes on. There we go. Look at that. Cued it perfectly. Um, so Kimberly uh, is our health strategic uh, consultant for the Darling Downs West Morton PHN. We all know Fran as our statewide clinical governance lead for checkup, and I'm the primary health consultant on behalf of Lada Consulting. And this has been a consortium uh, of working together in this project. So what I'll do is I'll move on to our next slide and let Fran just share a little bit about how we've gotten here today and uh, the, the planning and the processes that have gone in in the background to get us to this point. Thanks, Mario, and hi, everyone. Um, this is just very briefly, um, we thought it would be good to just describe how we got to where we are before we get to the main um, project. So this is really um, a, something that's been worked on for the past three years. So we're now in the third year. So in the first year, um, we spent time surveying health professionals around their understanding of the services available in their region so that they could prescribe other activities um, and physical activity and other um, programs to um, patients. And in the first year, we found that um, many health professionals um, lacked knowledge of the services um, around them, and that may have been because they were outreach providers, and they also lacked confidence in how they should prescribe services um, to patients and what they needed to know. Um, and then in the second year, um, we were planning on um, rolling it out and um, progressing the project a little bit further um, in a practical sense, but unfortunately COVID came in, so we shifted focus. We did a little bit more um, um, literature reviews of some of the other social prescribing programs um, that are being implemented around the world. Um, and with the COVID um, coming in, we found it was virtually impossible to engage with many of the primary healthcare professionals out there. So we spent some time developing tools um, to make social prescribing easier. And we linked with an online platform, GoShare, and we developed an online webinar around um, how to use the tools and the GoShare um, platform. So now we're in the third year and Mario and Kimberly are going to um, talk about where we are today um, with the project. Thank you, Fran. Um, so just to go into our next slide, um, <clears throat> I'll just share a little bit about Lata's experience uh, in the social prescribing work that we've done uh, across Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland. And uh, this is one of the projects that we had worked on uh, back in back in Victoria. Um, and it was, as you can see down the bottom, it's developed by community for community. And it was this idea of trying to engage um, uh, community members to be able to provide us with what would work well for them. And we were able to come up with a, a fairly significant model um, that has been continued to uh, work across the, the Victorian government um, in Gippsland, predominantly, but now we've also uh, replicated this project in Bendigo and Ballarat as well. Um, so traditional model um, in the sense that you've got a, le a link worker who assesses the need assessments of the patient and then uh, links them into community uh, using a prescription pad for holistic non-medical services. What we have then done is a little bit creative in regards to what we've 
I guess, worked on for the Darling Downs West Morton PHN. And that is the fact that we have continued to look at the, the patients that need social prescribing, and that hasn't necessarily changed. The other thing that hasn't changed is who, does the, who do those patients actually go to to get the services that they need? And that's our primary healthcare providers, like general practitioners, nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, um, other allied health services, and even additional services like Centrelink, for example. In our model specifically on this project, as I'll share a little bit later, we've only focused around the general practice side of things in the trial. Um, but what we've eliminated is the link worker. Um, or in other words, instead of saying we've eliminated them, we've actually supplemented them using GoShare, which is a digital health library that provides health education and lifestyle directories in the Darling Downs and West Morton uh, PHN region. What I'll do is I'll just share the next slide where Kimberly can share a little bit about um, the PHN focus on social prescribing. You're on mute, Kim. Sorry. Um, as you can see in the slide, uh, the Darling Downs West Morton PHN, we've taken quite a, a strong focus on social prescribing and using the model of social prescribing to um, engage other areas, including cancer screening. So whilst it's not necessarily um, a social prescribing, uh, cancer screening social prescribing, it, we're using the same platform, GoShare, to make sure that people are aware um, of the cancer screening, where they can have it and, and what's available. Um, we're, also, we're also engaged in a, a project uh, with Health and Wellbeing Queensland, West Morton uh, Health Service and the Ipswich Hospital Foundation. And we're looking at um, a, a, a program and a project of young people um, that uh, are obese and or need to look at some sort of uh, modif health modification or lifestyle modification. Um, so that's the youth health lifestyle project. And a big part of that is looking at a co-design piece with young people in the area um, to, to put together a social prescribing platform um, and, and areas of interest that might assist in looking at some of those lifestyle modifications for young people. Um, trying to, I guess, look at it from a preventative approach, um, you know, trying to prevent the onset of chronic disease, trying to pre prevent, um, you know, uh, ongoing health issues. Um, the other, the other um, area that we've got a big focus is diabetes and we have the West Morton Diabetes Alliance where again social prescribing is a big focus in, in that area as well and that's, that's again looking at lifestyle modification so people that are either pre-diabetic or um, type 2 diabetic where a change in lifestyle and diet and things like that would really help um, help people become more healthy and, and hopefully reduce the risk and or the, um, the prevalence of, of type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes. Um, the other one is the healthy heart checks. So that's, that's around, um, you know, making sure that people are, are being reminded and have access to information about how they can keep their, health, uh, their heart healthy and how they can... Um, use social prescribing to, to do that. We've, we found that particularly the, the healthy heart checks and the cancer screening, and, and it will be no surprise to anyone online that through COVID, those, those things have reduced. People haven't been having those checks. So I think it's really timely that we're doing this type of work because we can uh, use social prescribing and the model and um, using the, um, the GoShare platform and the green prescriptions to hopefully try and increase some of those areas. I think that's about it from me, Mario, in that sense. No, that's great. Yeah, thank you yep. so much. Um, I'll stay on this slide for one extra um, comment, and that is why I've put those two pictures in there around the respiratory clinics and the vaccination hubs is, is that have been, um, as I've identified in the organisations and the practices that I've visited, um, in the implementation of the social prescribing model is that that has been a real competing um, um, focus for general practitioners in particular and nurses. But um, that's one thing that um, we have been able to, I guess, work through. And so as I go on to our next slide, 
this is just giving you an overview of the project deliverables. So we we're looking to engage a minimum of 15 practices across the Darling Downs and West Morton PHN, um, providing the patients, uh, the doctors and nurses uh, who will then um, therefore provide the social prescribing education uh, to the patients that we would be seeing and really having a focus around, as Kimberly mentioned, the diabetes and chronic disease focus. Each practice was different um, and each model has been uh, adapted to those specific practices and their requirements and how they felt was the best way to move forward in that. And I'll share a little bit about that uh, as we come through the, the following slides. What we've also done is we've assisted uh, the practices in identifying the patients that, that, that would be most, most suitable for the project um, using tools such as uh, the pen cat tool, uh, utilization of go share tiles, and also the green prescriptions, which are also known as exercise prescriptions. Um, so what we've, what I've done is to try and provide you with a, a timeline of where the project started and where it's going to be most likely ending. Um, it started in on the 1st of June, 2021, where we opened up an expression of interest for general practices to, to come on board and to show us um, their, their engagement levels. On the 11th of June, which is about two weeks later, uh, we received four expression of interest, out of which two of them were uh, outside of our project scope, which was a community health organization and a pharmacy. But they did provide us with some very key insights that this project can be replicated and duplicated uh, on a much broader scale if we were to look at that um, outside of general practice. After that, what we did was we uh, worked alongside of uh, Kimberly and I, myself to identify a number of practices in the region that would be most suitable for the project. And we were able to very quickly identify 30 practices that would most likely be able to be narrowed down to 15 practices. Out of the 30 practices, uh, 23 practices were um, initially contacted. An initiation meeting was held where I physically presented the project to the practice principals and the practice manager, including a senior nurse if they were available as well. After that was completed, we were able to streamline it down to 15 practices who were most eager at the time. And we were able to then commence on the 19th of July, uh, clinical meetings that were held in the practice to present the social prescribing model and the lifestyle modification program to all practitioners in the practice, all nurses in the practice and administration staff who would be assisting those doctors and nurses as well. After the first round of visit visits were completed, we then had a community of practice meeting, uh, which was done online. Uh, but what we found was again, with those competing priorities that were within the practices, um, specifically around COVID-19 respiratory clinics and vaccination hubs, that the presentations for these community of practice meetings was very, very low. Um, and it was sitting around uh, 10 to 15% uh, in terms of engagement. So what we were then able to do was to work alongside of Checkup and the Darling Downs West Morton PHN to revise our implementation strategy and look at what allocated resources we still had available to be able to then uh, re-engage the practices to get them to, to work with us. And so we were then able to do a second round visit, which is currently being conducted uh, by myself. Um, and that started on the 29th of October. And I've been able to go into a number of practices and found some very key insights, which I'll again share with you in, in, in a short moment. Um, what we are then going to be doing and what we've already preset with as an expectation with the practices is that once the second round visits are completed, that we will recommence the community of practice meetings that will be held online for uh, consumers and also for the users uh, in terms of general practitioners and nurses to share their ideas and improvements on how the project can continue moving forward. What we will also be doing is we will be providing uh, clinicians and patients with a survey that will be conducted uh, towards the end of the project. And that will really give us an understanding as to how much uh, growth has been in the practices in their knowledge base and also uh, the tools that we have provided them uh, for prevention medicine, especially around the diabetes and chronic disease management focus. We are then also looking around uh, early to mid uh, February to also provide an evaluation report, which will be then presented to Checkup, um, and they will then be able to use those findings um, 
to seek for additional funding um, and also replicate the project across the region if need be as well. Um, some of the key things that, as I mentioned, that I was looking to bring up uh, was around practice engagement is the fact that we have um, social prescribing education that was modeled to, uh, from an individual program of the practice perspective. Um, and so what I was able to do was every time I presented the project to a practice, uh, doctors and nurses were, uh, had their own ideas that uh, were very much appreciated. And um, we were able to whiteboard of what a patient's journey would look like from the moment a patient was to come into a consultation and have that opportunistic conversation with the patient, uh, with the doctor, how can GoShare be used uh, to provide and promote the two things that we were looking for? One was health education, and secondly, uh, the lifestyle modifications in their local community that they can join, uh, which are community-based activities uh, to help with the prevention of uh, their health. What we also did was um, use, as I mentioned, the tools that were presently available in that as well. Um, that was through education to the doctors and the nurses. Some doctors were quite reluctant to use a new program due to the time constraints of their consultations and hence why they used administration staff instead, where they would just be able to recommend, let's say, for example, type two diabetes as a bundle that needs to be sent out to the patient and then the administration staff would follow through on that action for the doctor. Continued practice engagements as we've gone back into the second round of visits have really allowed us to ascertain some feedback on what's working for the doctors, for the nurses and for the administration staff and how can they be improved. Um, we've also been able to provide education on the use of GoShare and how it can send recalls and reminders to patients around examples like uh, 45 to 49 year old health assessments. We've also been able to look at Medicare billing schedules uh, for education around uh, item numbers that should be used uh, in the social prescribing model as well. Um, some of the practice barriers that we've found is that six practices were unable to participate in the model due to issues such as workforce shortages, concerns of staff welfare, uh, fear of burnout, low staff morale, increased workload in COVID-19, um, GPs from some practices were not comfortable relying solely on a particular model uh, or a project like GoShare, um, but recognize the value of referring patients to health resources on that platform as well. Uh, lack of integration of GoShare in clinical software was one of the reoccurring themes that could continue to come back. And as a fellow general practice uh, employee myself, um, I've, I've been able to see that, that uh, the integration of softwares um, is always one of the things that um, is a hurdle that general practices have to go through because doctors are again so time poor and nurses as well. What we've also been able to do for you is to provide you with some early findings of the GP surveys that we've completed. Uh, so 51 responses have been received so far from the practicing general practices. Um, respondents were unanimous in their opinion that the education provided uh, in the clinical meetings was just right. Uh, more than half of the respondents rated their confidence in providing a social prescribing and knowledge of uh, lifestyle modifications in their communities as average. Um, so we've been able to assess that and provide you with a graph that just gives you an understanding as to what that would look like. And again, I'm happy to share these slides with you um, if need be. Uh, the post survey will also be con uh, conducted, which is generally at about a three month mark uh, to, for us to be able to see what What's that growth been like for the doctors and nurses? And um, some of the practice feedback that we've received as well. Um, I've been able to allocate this into general practitioners, nurses, and practice managers. Uh, general practitioners had a limited knowledge of social prescribing. They were reluctant to use a program like GoShare at the start, uh, wanted to have access to GoShare to familiarize themselves. And then in the second visit, we've been able to see such a dramatic change because they've been able to effectively use GoShare bundles. And one example is Dr. Mahmood from Gatton. Um, he has um, created for his patients um, working groups um, on softwares like Facebook, uh, Messenger and WhatsApp. And they are patient cohorts of about 30 people who suffer with a similar condition. And what he's been able to do is actually uh, use GoShare to provide lifestyle modification programs and health education to those specific groups based on diabetes, 
um, you know, chronic heart disease um, and so on and so forth and asthma and things like that. And what he's been able to do is just once a week drop in a video or an information sheet that is relevant to the patients in that group and be able to then provide social prescribing from that perspective, which is really great. Um, nurses, again, uh, they find that GoShare adds value to the conversations they hold. And um, they've also been able to then use that in terms of recalls and reminders. Practice managers have wanted us to provide the exercise prescriptions in a digital format. So we've been able to create that for them as well and integrate that into their clinical software. So doctors can simply just print that out on a patient's file and have that recorded in the patient's um, uh, clinical notes as well. So I'm not gonna take up too much time. I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that we had 20 minutes and we're on 21 minutes now. So I'll just bring it up to questions and feedback if anyone has anything to share. Thanks, Mario. Um, just looking at the chat there. Um, yeah, we have a question from Bradley again. Is there ability to measure patient click-throughs and level of patient engagement on the GoShare content? Yeah, so there actually is. Um, GoShare has, uh, what happens is that when it creates a URL specific to the bundle that's been sent out to a patient, um, what it does is it doesn't obviously record the patient's details, but it does record when the patient in fact clicked on the link and how long they actually spent on that link. So if the resource, for example, had uh, five videos, which we all know on average take about four minutes each, that would be 20 minutes of time. Uh, and we can record um, that a click in fact happened, which took the patient to those resources that were available. And then secondly, um, how long they actually spent on that as well. That will allow us to be able to then also send out the surveys to the patients that have been most using the GoShare link uh, so that we can actually survey them on the experience that they've had from the doctor's perspective of having the consultation and the resources that they've received and have they actually been helpful to them in their, in their prevention health. Thanks, Mario. Um, and Brad says thanks as well. Any other questions before we wrap this session up? No, it doesn't look like it. So a big thank you to Mario, Fran and Kimberly for coming along today. It's great that the three organisations are working together, um, really getting some great results there. So um, thanks again. And can we make your presentation available? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. So you'll all get a copy of that um, later. So thank you. And we'll move on now to our final speaker of the morning. Um, and it's Tracy Johnson from Anala Primary Care. Many of you will know um, Tracy. She's presented at our QPHCN meetings for many years now on different topics. And she's also got a presentation looking at social prescribing. Uh, Tracy, you can hear me and um, let's just check your mic there. You're on mute. There I am. I can hear you. There you are. Good to see you again. Good to see you again, David. Are you okay, okay to share your screen? I am just about to open up my presentation. So let me share my screen in 30 seconds. You're right. Yeah. Um, so while um, Trace is getting that, um, just a reminder, a big thank you to um, Hester for sponsoring today. And we will please do um, stick around at the end of Tracy's presentation um, and we'll hear from um, Nanita from Hester. Okay, Tracy, uh, over to you. Okay, so everyone can see my screen, I'm presuming, David? Yes, they can. Awesome. Um, so we're a general practice, and I have to say um, it was fascinating to hear the previous presentation um, from the folks working in Darling Downs, West Morton. So we're based at Inala, which is actually on the border between Darling Downs, West Morton and Metro South or Brisbane South Primary Health Network. Um, so being in the sort of community we're in, largely a social housing suburb, one of the poorest suburbs in Queensland, what we see amongst our patient group consistently is the social determinants of health in action. Um, so we see people who struggle to, with food insecurity, with housing overcrowding, with employment, um, with lots of family tension, domestic violence, all of those sorts of fun things that uh, make life so much more stressful for so many of our patients. So as a consequence, 
What we've tried to do over the last few years is move into social prescribing, hasn't been easy, um, but we've certainly had some support from our primary health network too. So I'll talk to you about how that works and how we'd like to see social prescribing evolve. But to get started, let's actually look at um, what we all face in general practice. So every general practice has a bunch of patients who attend more frequently than others. So what we've found is that if you, on average, according to this article, um, look at your top 10% of patients by attendance rate. So for a lot of practices, it'll be less than a thousand patients. Um, so we use best practice as our practice management software. There's actually a script you can run in best practice to try and find who are your most frequent attender patients um, within the top 1000. Um, so we have had a look at that um, and then we've done a whole lot of data aggregation and what we actually found was we had 6% of our patients who were accounting for 24% of our appointments. We then had a further, or in addition, we had 18% of patients who took up roughly 48% of our patient um, diary time. So this notion of frequent attenders taking up more time than others is certainly true in our experience and in the experience of the people that wrote this article. So there was nothing unusual there. I think what is interesting is that in general practice, when you have these patients who attend so frequently, and often they're attending not just for medical reasons, they're attending because they're lonely, they're concerned, they're worried. There's all of these things happening in their lives that perhaps they don't have other people that they can talk to that they trust. So as a consequence, what we're seeing is a combination of medical need and need driven by social isolation. Now we're funded to deliver a medical model. We're trained in a medical model. Um, what we need to start thinking about is a biopsychosocial model that more accurately reflects the need for support that these patients have. Because simply having them come in more frequently, we can do something. But if we only rely on what we're trained to do medically, we're not going to achieve as much as we could do. So that's where we've tried to embrace social prescribing. Amongst our patient community, um, what we certainly see as one of the drivers of frequent attendance is this notion of loneliness and isolation. So more than two thirds of our patients were born overseas in a country where English was not the primary language. So we have a lot of patients who've got transitional adjustment issues around living in a new culture, even if they've been here for decades. They certainly have language issues, they have discrimination issues, they have absence of family and connectivity in many instances. Um, so they struggle, particularly as they age um, and particularly as they're teenagers and young adults. They're the two groups that we see the biggest burden of loneliness and social isolation. There's a wonderful group here at the University of Queensland in, um, if you're a Queensland based person, um, led by the Haslams. Um, so Catherine and Alex are married. They're both psychology researchers. Um, they're joined by Genevieve Dingle, who you'll see listed on this textbook. Um, and what they've created is Australia's leading centre into social prescribing research. But before they really moved into that, they really tried to dimension just how bad and what did it mean in terms of health outcomes if people are lonely and if they're isolated. And this is the book. It's a bit heavy reading, lots of, you know, textbooky kind of stuff and lots of stats, but it's fascinating reading. And basically what it says is that if you're lonely, you have three times the risk of poor health outcomes of somebody who smokes. So think about that. We spend a lot of time talking to people about their smoking status, their excess, or their eating and exercise. How much time do we actually spend talking to our patients about loneliness? In other countries, they've got a whole lot bolder and they've talked about an epidemic of loneliness and that was before COVID made everyone socially isolate and stay home. So there were already ministries for loneliness in government um, in the UK, in Canada and parts of the United States in recognition of the fact that we've become an increasingly fragmented society where people are living independently at home and not having a lot of contact with others. So what this book and what a whole bunch of other research shows is that providing social support can change the mortality and morbidity rates of patients particularly in circumstances like the one we serve where we're working in a context of social injustice all of the time. And social injustice is so important because it reduces opportunities for people to access high quality healthcare and to engage in healthy behaviours because they have to travel further. There's all sorts of ongoing stress and financial issues, which means they don't eat as well, exercise as well, and generally feel as in control of their lives. So in recognition of that, the Queensland Parliament at the moment is running an inquiry into loneliness. We actually provided a submission to that 
parliamentary inquiry and then we were asked to present um, to the parliamentary inquiry a few weeks ago. So I'm really keen and enthused that the Queensland government is also starting to take this notion of people are more than just their bodies. It's about how they live and whether they feel they're living well and whether they're feeling connected that could in fact change health outcomes and community dynamics all around us. So what really goes into a social prescription? Well, the first thing is obviously some sort of recommendation. Um, you need to be advised that there is an opportunity for you to do something um, hard and serious. Um, so that needs to be in some way consolidated, possibly documented. I noticed that in the previous group, they've done that through a green script pad. You then have a person um, who works with you, um, typically a link worker, a nurse care coordinator, or some other sort of person who works with you on what does that mean for you in terms of a goal? So in the case of most GP practices that don't have access to link workers and some of the supports that are coming through West Morton, it would typically be your GP or practice nurse. So they would talk to you and say, well, okay, you need to exercise more. What sorts of exercise interest you? Is it walking? Is it taekwondo? Is it tennis? Is it, you know, bowls? Um, how do you make that happen? What are some opportunities for you to do that locally, etc.? And then hopefully they help you navigate to a nearby group that does a park run because you, you know, you ran 20 years ago and you wouldn't mind taking it up again. So there's these three stages, formulation, communication and engagement with the patient so that they understand what it means for them and they've got some options to explore hopefully some support to explore those options because a lot of people find it confronting to go somewhere for the first time and not know anyone and then ultimately working within that group setting outside of a healthcare provider to actually enmesh themselves with a bunch of other people that like doing the same thing this is the essence of social prescribing so to do that well you've got to have time with the patient to understand what's driving some of the behaviors what's motivating them or not motivating them you've got to have knowledge of what's available out there as an activity. So GoShare and various other platforms are available to help bring to patients knowledge about what's out there. And then of course, there's the greasing of the wheel so that patients feel comfortable turning up somewhere. One thing I wanna highlight is that social prescribing, whilst as a language, it's comparatively new, as a practice, it's definitely not new. So I worked with Consumers Health Forum and the College of General Practitioners um, to deliver a forum in Melbourne in November, 2019. So in the lead up to that forum, the RACGP ran a survey amongst its member group. They got 500 odd responses. And this is what those responses said, that basically a lot of GPs are engaging in social prescribing right now. This is not something that's unfamiliar to them, even if the language is they know that they don't have all of the answers in their script pads um, to actually deal with what patients are dealing with. The struggle for general practitioners is that they were trained in a medical model and they were told that they were gods and that you know they've often performed in this very lone ranger model rather than in a team-based care model. So one of the things that makes our practice a bit different is that we embraced team-based care a long time ago because we knew that doctors couldn't do everything and we were fortunate being a charitable GP practice that we could move funding around in different ways. So what we've been trying to do is ramp up this notion of the biopsychosocial model, understanding the social determinants of health and intergenerational trauma and things like that, and really trying to say, well, what is affecting this patient and how is that driving their health outcomes before we end up with an acute presentation for that healthcare need? So to do that, we're heavily reliant on a team. So we have nurses, allied health, all within our practice. So included in that team over the last five years are social workers, mental health care nurses, mental health workers. Um, we have nurse care coordinators now. So we've really broadened our team of care. And we've started trying to create a health and social care neighbourhood. So we have active partnerships in place with the likes of Mission Australia, Wesley Mission, St Vincent's, a whole bunch of providers around here, QPAS, et cetera. Um, who provide sometimes only healthcare, sometimes health and social care, so that we can appropriately link our people to the sorts of opportunities that are available in this neighbourhood. One of the things that we're ramping up and we're not there yet is to be trauma informed, to look at adverse childhood experiences, to look at what trauma means in terms of residual stress in people's bodies and the way they react and respond in a healthcare environment. So if you've had trauma of any type, one of the things that you need to do is be given back control. And one of the great things about social prescribing, unlike prescribing medications where the doctor's kind of going, well, you know, a bit of shared decision making here, you've got diagnosis X, I can treat it with um pharmaceutical agent why do you want it 
not as much control in that conversation for the patient. Whereas if all of a sudden it's about, look, I can see that you're gaining weight. Does that bother you? Yes, it does. What are the sorts of things you've tried to do about gaining that weight? Well, you know, I try and not eat as much when I'm emotional, you know, but I'm struggling to get outside because of these things or whatever. So all of a sudden by engaging with the patient where they're at and what the drivers of their circumstances are and giving them back control, as you do in a social prescription, it's up to them to determine, well, what might they be able to do to address that and giving them real choice. And that can, in fact, engage patients in their healthcare an awful lot more than you as a clinician going, well, there's your diagnosis, here's the recommendation, are you gonna do it? They're much more likely to resist that. Because what we're really trying to do is acknowledge that patients only generally have about five hours a year in front of a clinician, and they're, they're even the most complex patients only end up with about five hours a year. So they've got 8,700 odd hours a year having to do it for themselves. So we're trying to equip them by using a combination of health and social care to better self-manage. So what we've done internally is we've formed some partnerships. We've advocated with our primary health network and they've given us some access to some pilot money and we've created these new models of care. Um, so Footprints started out as a homeless organisation in the inner part of Brisbane CBD. They've expanded and done remarkable work for a number of years now. So Footprints picked up a contract that Brisbane South Primary Health Network offered to embed social workers in general practices. So there's now five practices that actually have a social worker coming and working out of our practice. Ours is here on a Monday. Um, they've been fantastic in terms of helping us get patients access to the NDIS helping our patients get access to better housing and better, more appropriate housing um, funding that comes through the social welfare system. Um, the referral criteria are that they can have a maximum of three chronic conditions. Sometimes that's a bit challenging for us. We have a lot of people that have a lot more than three chronic conditions. Um, they have to have some sort of psychosocial support need um, and we do a warm handover between our clinical team and the social worker so we very much work within the team environment that we've created here because the social worker works from a room within our practice. One of our challenges there is that room is not funded, the, the social worker is provided but there's no actual funding for the room so in a way we're kind of down revenue um, but in another way these patients are not spending as much time with doctors so therefore we can get more revenue throughput because doctors are seeing more patients rather than spending as much time with some of these patients because what we found is that six percent of patients who take up 24 percent of our time on average the average length of consult was 27 minutes so everything that we can do to drive down that average length of time in the consult generates and frees up more time to earn other revenue. We've also got a fabulous partnership in place with MARTA Health Services. So we advocated with them and with the Primary Health Network around our patients that don't speak English or come from a non-English speaking background, because these patients frequently no show to hospital environments and other outpatient activities and all sorts of other things that we send them off to do. So they've provided us with um, a nurse care coordinator two days a week. She does nothing other than work with these people from multicultural backgrounds. She tries to unblock the hospital system for them. She tries to um, make a whole bunch of other things happen. So there's a bit of overlap between what she does and the social worker does. Um, but her focus is really on our multicultural patients. We've done an evaluation of that work and it was staggeringly successful. Our team can't possibly imagine a world without our MQs care coordinator. We've also ramped up some internal groups. So we've got the Well Connected group running. So this is for our patients over 65 who are very vulnerable and lonely. And we deliberately brought them together and run education for them on how to use uh, e-scripts, how to use video health, um, what does COVID mean for them, etc. And just by bringing them together for a social activity, it's interesting how many of them are now starting to walk together and connect with each other and things like that. We've also got Genevieve Dingle from the University of Queensland running a program called Groups for Health. And it's specifically designed for patients who have difficulty setting goals. They're so passive and so of the belief that life just happens to them and generally it's bad, that they find it hard to be motivated enough to set a goal because they're not confident that they'll achieve it. So Groups for Health is about helping them transition to a point of more control and certainty in their lives so that they will set a few goals, they will get on and do some things that are good and positive and healthy for them. Um, the model of originally came out of working with people with addiction um, and this is the pilot for getting um, that particular model working more broadly. So I mentioned we'd done a review of the MChoose model um, because it's now a multi-site model at MARTA are funding in six GP practices. What we found was there was vastly and radically improved attending um, at hospital 
at radiology, at pathology, at all sorts of other visits that the patients needed to make. And I mean vastly improved, like 80% plus increases. We found there were reduced visits to the GP um, because patients were actually getting on and doing the things that they should do to maintain better health. So there wasn't the frequency of GP visits where it's like, okay, I can see you're sick, but I can't really do much for you because I don't have any blood results in front of me. Um, we also found that those patients were tapping into the NDIS and disability support pensions um, so that they were getting better quality of life because they had new resources to use. We found vastly improved health literacy because the nurse was able to spend the time with them to explain if you go and get this blood test, it's actually not treatment. It's merely just helping us with diagnosis or why do you need to take this medication every day and forever rather than just, you know, when you feel like it, when you feel sick. What we found amongst our team was vastly improved joy at work. You know, their sense of frustration with some of these patients that were just so hard to manage. Um, they're still difficult and complex, but by having the nurse care coordinator working with them behind them and supporting these patients, I was certainly finding it was much more satisfying and less stressful to work here. We found that two thirds of the nurse activity actually involved external liaison and of that 85% was liaising with Queensland Health because typically these patients track publicly and it's typically public appointments they don't turn up to and if they don't turn up a couple of times then they get sent to the bottom of the list or they get discharged from the hospital environment. Um, so there was actually a huge benefit for Queensland Health in having these m nurse care coordinators working with these patients because they had a much lower no-show rate and much better outcomes with the patient. One of our challenges was, again, we were providing a room two days a week to a nurse. There was no income for us from that room other than the better care that was being offered to the patient and the reduced time um, that they were spending with our doctors. It has involved changes to GP workflow. Um, so we truly needed these people to be able to be using our electronic patient management system and patient records so that the GP and the nurse care coordinator and the nurse involved with the patient more generally, if they've got chronic disease, could constantly be communicating with each other. Um, so we certainly had to uh, work through all of that confidentiality and access to our patient records, et cetera, so that this model could work. But we love it so much that if it stops, I think you know, you'll see me wandering around the front of Parliament House advocating for change. The other thing that we've been involved with very, very heavily is the 10-year health reform process. Um, so I was lucky enough to be selected to be part of the Voices of 100, um, and they're the group that were most intensively consulted about the shape of what is now out um, as the consultation draft for the next 10 years of primary care. So consultation on that draft is actually closed um, and I'm working with the Commonwealth in committee processes to finalise that document, which will be released by Greg Hunt as soon as Greg Hunt gets around to releasing it, um, presumably before the election. There's some really, really great stuff in there. And what I want to highlight is that in this document um, are these statements. Um, patients who use health services need to be able to readily follow established care pathways but they need navigation support um, and they need access to social care options. So that was actually mentioned in this strategy. Um, what was also mentioned was that patients need to have and be provided through the strategy with enhanced access to services through their chosen practice. And what that means is that over time, over the next particularly three to five years, this document is predicting radical enhancement to the staffing and the nature of the teams that we will have in general practice. And within the teams, part of their work is listed as being social prescribing. This is the first time I've ever seen such a thing in any government document, that social prescribing is being picked up as something that general practice should and must do. Um, this is a statement from the document as well, the value of social prescribing and link and support workers with lived experience cannot be underestimated to provide tailored support to specific populations. Certainly our work with our multicultural communities, with our patients with mental health issues, with our patients who've got an experience of trauma. One of the things that is really fundamental in terms of all of this social prescribing work is that the person who's the glue to that social prescription really must be trusted and understood by the patient as somebody that understands the lived experience of that patient. If you look down on them, on them and go, well, you know what, you're just a bit lazy or you're not very compliant or some of those things that it's easy to label patients who are easy to ignore and hard to serve, um, all of a sudden the whole thing will break down. By having people who've got some lived experience or vast experience of working with these groups, it works a whole lot better. And that's been acknowledged in the strategy as a potential employment pathway and recommendation so that people with lived experience can perform these roles. 
One of the core recommendations is that there's the development of a national social, social prescribing framework, i.e. what should we all be doing and what hangs off that, um, linked to what primary care generally is doing, and that there are pilots enabled through primary health networks within the first 12 months of this strategy being an accepted government document. So what I'm predicting is that, you know, Greg Hunt will launch the strategy sometime soon. Um, it is a strategy that's actually been accepted by both sides of politics, so I think it will stand. So before Christmas next year, you will start seeing primary health networks and others starting to talk about social prescribing and pilots in their area, hopefully learning from Darling Downs and other places in Victoria, et cetera, where social prescribing has already taken root. Um, so that's our experience um, of working with social prescribing in more formal models of care. Obviously, our doctors do it all day, our nurses do it all day in more informal ways. So happy to take questions. Thanks, Tracy. I'm just looking at the chat again. Um, no questions have been typed up at this point, but a really comprehensive presentation. Tracy, great to see what's happening. Um, we're just getting a thank you or two there. So, um, yeah, always great to have you present. And, um, really exciting um, things to come, it sounds like, with the, the release of the new strategy. So um, can we share your presentation? I've been asking everyone. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, we do have Bradley. Good on you, Bradley. You've asked a question every session. Um, interested to understand the practicalities of social prescribing, what systems support the GPs to refer? Okay, so when we're introducing any of the social prescribing models that we've introduced, um, we actually engage in co-design. So when we were rolling out the nurse care coordinator for our called communities, for example, we brought MARTA in, ran some workshops with our team around exactly what the scope of practice, what the handover protocols, what the use of our patient rec record system, et cetera, would all be. Um, so we developed our own internal systems and protocols. Um, then we also co-developed an evaluation framework. So our doctors knew what we were measuring um, and how we would be measuring it, as did the nurse care coordinator and other stakeholders to that model. Um, in terms of other really formal supports, um, we use my community directory um, as a place that has a whole big listing. So I think my community directory at the moment receives funding from something like 54 councils um, across Queensland and elsewhere. Um, they've got a really interactive and interesting platform that they've developed, so we certainly use that. We've had access to GoShare um, as well through our primary health network. Um, and because we're actively networking all of the time with other care providers around here, we tend to know a little bit about what's going on in this community, but certainly by having these care coordination type people here, they're the ones that everyone else in our team goes to and goes, do you know where I can get my patient involved in a knitting group or, you know, whatever? They've become sort of the repository of that broader knowledge. So in a way, the people have become part of the system too. Um, in terms of what other systems support the GPs get, other than constantly reviewing these models and getting feedback on how many patients have been referred and what the current caseload is for these people and how long it'll take to get into some of the care coordination models, um, I think that's probably the whole system for us. Um, certainly we induct and educate all of the new people that join our team about our approach um, so that it's just part of the expectations of what they do. Thanks, Tracy, and thanks again, Brad, for the question. All right, well, um, we're coming to the end, but before we go, I, I did mention earlier that we're really pleased that HESTA are supporting our Queensland Primary Healthcare Network meetings. Uh, in the next few meetings as well. So, and we hope to have some face-to-face -face meetings next year again and, and lunch as we used to do. Um, and because another part of this, the concept of this meeting is for people to meet each other. And it's very difficult, obviously, on a webinar, but we've had great examples of people coming along and then meeting someone from an organisation that they wouldn't typically have a conversation with. And we, we have some examples of people who have then gone on to actually do projects together. So we're really keen to get back face-to-face uh, -face next year. And thanks to HESTA, uh, we will be able to do that. So, Nanita, would you like to um, have a quick chat with the delegates today and um, tell them what you're up to? Would love to. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I also miss networking face-to-face. -face. I think we all do in this day and age. Probably not today because it is a bit wet. Um, I think we probably appreciated not getting around. Um, today, in light of uh, the health and well-being topic, I just wanted to 
um, add a little bit of a spin on HESA, so I won't take too much of your time. And of course, add my acknowledgement to the traditional custodians on the land that we're all digitally meeting on today. So at HESTA, we invest in and for people who make our world better, which is why it's a privilege to sponsor today's event. So thank you, David. Um, a part of my job is to find opportunities to partner with organisations to either provide or support them with their own health and wellbeing programs. So we do this by offering financial wellbeing support in the form of super health checks, um, not the same as health checks, obviously, but it is um, something that we try to keep a bit lighthearted. We know super is not the most exciting topic to talk about, and it doesn't matter regardless if you're a HESTA member or a HESTA partner, we, we do this for a lot of people. Um, they're con conducted in the workplaces just 20 minute sessions, one to one appointments, or digitally booked online. Um, but we also like to do this um, face to face, um, you know, over a presentation so that you can get a general idea of what you need to think about when it comes to super. So if you'd like to see how we could partner with you, um, please get in touch with me. I'll just pop something in the chat that I've pre written and hopefully can hit enter. So my details are there. Um, if you want to get in touch with me and see how that might work for your organization. And something else you may not know about HESTA is our research into the health and community sector. So we've just recently um, released one of our reports into community and disability services, and it's actually been beautifully summarised in a video that I just like to end and play on, if that's okay with you, David. Yes, definitely. If you can share that, that'd be awesome. great. Awesome. Share screen. Just have just having a sound. Um mm. is it playing it? Can you hear the sound at your end? I can. Maybe it's because I am talking. So maybe If you oh, can't hi, hear sorry. it, it's, um, it, there's a link. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> sorry, I just was talking away there. Um, <laughs> that's myself, okay. But I was just saying, Anita, it's not working. So why don't we? That's send okay. The link? links, the link is actually in that chat that I've sent through. So if you get a chance to watch it, um, please have a look at it. I'm hearing the beautiful music as I speak, so I don't know what's happening there. Got to love Zoom. You've got to love it. So um, thank you, everyone. And I do hope that, yeah, we'll all get together and actually meet face-to-face -face next time. Thanks, David. Thank you. And, yeah, sorry that didn't work. But we, when we send the presentations to everyone, the people who turned turned up today, but we actually had about another 20 or 30 people who register, but for whatever reasons, they can't turn up on the day. So we'll make sure they get the recordings and the presentations as well. So um, Perfect. Yeah, we'll send that out to everyone. And thanks again. Awesome. Um, Have a great day, everyone. <laughs> and that concludes our QPHCN meeting for today and for the year. Um, as I said earlier, we have for a year, typically um, in February, May, August and November. Um, we've had a few topics that we tend to repeat um, we, we usually do reconciliation as a topic in May, mental health in August, uh, workforce and workforce strategies in February and health and wellbeing in um, November. So we'll, we'll have a look at that. There is some talk of having a couple of extra meetings because there are more topics um, that people want to discuss. So we'll, we'll think about that and, and maybe have a couple of extra special meetings next year because we do know that people you know, don't get a lot of other opportunities to, to get together. So, so thank you to all our speakers today. Really great presentations. And as I said, we'll send that around to you um, following today's meeting. So we'll see you all in 2022. Have a great rest of the year. Um, and I'll sign off. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.